Hi, this is Dr. John Grazel, the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland, and this is another synopsis presentation in connection with our course on peace building, post-conflict reconstruction, and international development. And today we focus on one of our case studies, the country of Zimbabwe. The purpose of this presentation is not actually to discuss the problems of Zimbabwe, but to discuss Zimbabwe as a lesson for development and the presumptions of development and the challenges to future development. And in particular, two major presumptions that we're going to use in Bali to challenge. First is the foundational principle of sovereignty. Uh, and in this case, what does it tell us about that principle? Not only in terms of internal sovereignty, the sovereign as the one who determines what happens within their country, but also the sovereign system, which is supported by the actions of uh, the sovereign nations themselves. The second lesson that we're going to look at carefully is the lesson of development. There's an operative presumption in international development that failed states, poor states, underdeveloped states need good institutions. And if you build good institutions, somehow that will uh, result in good development, or good judiciary, good economic policies, etc. And we're going to see that that doesn't work with Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe uh, presents us with a challenge in that, uh, to that presumption uh, because actually we're going to see how Zimbabwe was a country filled with excellent institutions and it actually uh, descended into underdevelopment with the conscious destruction and undermining of those institutions. So it tells us you have to deal with another factor and institutions by themselves cannot assure uh, the sustainable development. Let's quickly look at what was Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe came out of uh, the British colony, which was called Rhodesia. It was a very prosperous, successful British colony. Uh, it had uh, uh, excellent uh, resources, particularly it had an excellent land and, and uh, large farms, and its major crop was tobacco, uh, but it had other uh, food crops as well. Highly productive, highly efficient operation. Uh, and uh, the, clearly, the whites were in control. The whites had grabbed the best land. The whites controlled most of uh, the, uh, the big businesses. But it didn't have the, the bitter apartheid system of South Africa. And as a result, even though the whites were on top, in fact, uh, the Zimbabwean, the African Zimbabweans, actually kept and increased their capacities, even when it was a, a colony and they weren't given the, uh, equal political, economic, or social freedom. It declared its independence. It was the whites, actually, who, who, who under Ian Smith, who actually uh, declared its independence to keep it as an independent white uh, country. Uh, and the reaction to that was the, the development of a freedom-fighting movement. And that movement was led by Robert Mugabe, who came from the majority group called the Shona-speaking people, and an ally uh, uh, from the Matabele in Como, uh, Joshua and Como, who came from what we call Matabele land, about 20% of the population. Uh, and eventually, with a lot of pressure from the international community, uh, power was transferred. But the reality was that the prosperity of the country was largely built on the highly effective use of that land, uh, particularly, as I said, for tobacco, but for other things, and not necessarily in small farmer holdings. And, and so, basically... Um, there, there, it was a perpetual juggling between the expectations of independence and the realities of, of, uh, of economy. But the fact was that at independence, it, it did have strong institutions. It had a very professional army. Uh, it, uh, and I'm talking about African members, not uh, just white. It had a very professional judiciary. It had an excellent uh, relative education system. It had a very highly functioning and effective economy. It had a good health system. So it had all these strong institutions. It had a uh, democratic government. Uh, what happened, however, though, is Mugabe very quickly made it clear that he didn't see himself as sharing power with the Como. He favored a one-party state with himself at the head of the state. But precisely because it had such strong institutions, uh, including a professional army, he created parallel capacities to undermine them. And the first example was that is he created something called the Fifth Brigade. He had the North Koreans came in. He trained them in North Korea. He had the North Koreans come in. Uh, they developed this separate armed force called the Fifth Brigade. It went into Matabili land, and it killed tens of thousands of people and basically uh, crushed 
that uh, in Como and, and the Matabilila uh, group and, and helped him consolidate his power. Uh, once in power, uh, still operating as a seeming democracy, you had years of, of juggling uh, uh, between uh, the productivity of land and how to redistribute it, and Mugabe's desire to ever increase his centralization of power, and the institutions of the country, like the judiciary, pushing back uh, to preserve um, democracy, real democracy, in, in Zimbabwe. And eventually, uh, two factors sort of uh, delivered the coup de grace. Uh, one, Mugabe decided to finally expropriate the majority of land from the large white farmer. The uh, agricultural production just nosedived and withered the economy of much of the, of the country. And th another thing happened that was really very interesting. The war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo broke out. And Mugabe saw that as an act, uh, opportunity himself. And he went into the Congo in support of Kabila against the Rwandans, uh, and he sent the army in. And in the process, there was a lot of resistance, actually, in Zimbabwe, but in the process, the uh, key people in the army got involved in, in the expropriation of mineral resources out of the Congo. And he basically was able to finally corrupt the Zimbabwe Higher Command Army uh, with the spoils of the Congo War. So having destroyed the land uh, situation and having destroyed the institutions of the of, uh, of the army and basically beaten the judiciary up for, for years, uh, he pretty much got hold of the power he wanted. Uh, the consequences for the country over these years have been terrible. Half the country basically has fled and lives outside the country because there's no functioning economy for them to participate. The country has one of the highest, perhaps the highest HIV AIDS rate in Africa. It has massive inflation. Uh, uh, and instead of being one, an exporter of agricultural production, it has very widespread hunger. And this is where we get into the question, how come he's a, he was able to do this? He was able to do this because sitting in the chair of the sovereign and being recognized as the sovereign, he was able to basically fulfill that sovereign role of being the adjudicator, the rule maker, the decider for his country. But this is very important. There's also a function of the sovereign state as the authenticator of the sovereign system itself. Sovereign states recognize each other, and it was the recognition by the other African countries uh, that authenticated him as continuing as the sovereign. And more than any other person, key to this was, uh, was President Mbeki of South Africa, who, despite actually uh, a lot of pressure from South Africans themselves, because of his relation with Mugabe, both as a freedom fighter and as an African politician, that trumped uh, the exercise of any responsibility as an authenticator to actually say, this sovereign needs to be retired. So, so. Mugabe is still basically in power as the central power because of the failure of the other African sta states to use their roles as authenticators to take him out of power. What does this tell us as, as for development? Uh, it tells us uh, that the system whereby sovereign states and the sovereigns of those states are the authenticators itself may have, have to be challenged and changed. Uh, the people themselves and Zimbabwe seem not to be able to be the authenticator of who will be their sovereign. It's the other sovereigns of other countries. Uh, the second thing it tells us is that if you want institutions uh, to actually fulfill the roles we, we give to them within a sovereign state, they need to be nested in a larger series of institutions that basically protect them. And we don't have that now. The sovereign states are the ultimate institutions. The UN is made up of sovereign states. And so the time has come when we may need to begin to look in terms of global government for another type of institution, not one that controls or overrides the sovereign state, but uh, transforms it and, and keeps it honest uh, to its purposes and its responsibilities. Uh, and Zimbabwe shows us, uh, till we get that, just what can happen despite the best of institutions, the best of capacities within a developed country.